We're live. David. Okay, welcome uh, students to uh, this Google Hangout uh, towards the end of our second week of the course. Um, our topic for this week has been the use of force in uh, counterterrorism. And we've started with uh, the legal framework. We had a number of lectures about the, the Bush doctrine and then its application uh, to the conflict in Iraq and uh, also some discussion about Afghanistan. Uh, joining us to illuminate uh, our understanding of these topics is uh, my colleague here at Duke University and friend, uh, Peter Fever. Um, Peter is a professor of political science uh, here at Duke, uh, has a, a, a lengthy publication record, but his uh, uh, field of, uh, he's one of the leading authorities in civil military relations uh, in the political science arena. But uh, I think more importantly, perhaps for our discussion today, he's done uh, two uh, stints of service in the, uh, at the National Security Council, first under President uh, Clinton, uh, but uh, more critically for today, under President Bush. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I think it was 2006 and 2007 um, when he was... 2005 and 2007. Okay, he was very much in the inner circle on uh, a number of uh, national security uh, policies, but especially a uh, formulation of uh, a, a rock policy during that time. So, Peter Fever, uh, thank you for joining us uh, and welcome. It's good to be here. Terrific. Well, uh, well, let's dive right in. Um, Peter, uh, a lot of people, uh, historians now, uh, journalists are looking back at the Bush era and, and asking themselves, well, why did we uh, go into war uh, in Iraq? Uh, and as I've presented in this, uh, in this uh, course, there really were an amalgam of reasons. I think it's wrong to point at any uh, one. Uh, it was a, about the, the nature of the threat and uh, the, the UN sanctions were breaking down and the no-fly zone. And, and it seemed to be an amalgam, but they all seemed for President Bush to point in the direction of war in Iraq and, and regime change. Do you, do you think that's a fair characterization of why we went to Iraq? Yes, uh, I think that uh, the administration came in to office, and I should uh, uh, remind you, you and the uh, viewers that I I worked in the second administration, 2005 uh, to 2007, so I wasn't there, and so I'm not speaking from firsthand experience, but of course I talked to the folks who were there, and I've, I've studied the issue closely, and and my read of the record and what I hear from my friends who were there uh, from the beginning, several uh, un, uh, um, problems that were left in the inbox by the, the Clinton administration. Every administration, when they leave office, they leave a number of problems that are not uh, solved and they kick it over to the next administration. Certainly Bush did that to Obama, and it looks like Obama will do that to whoever comes next. And in that pile was Iraq. And the administration thought that Iraq was one of those that uh, was likely to uh, require addressing at some point on their watch. Um, and there were some, Paul Wolfowitz uh, being the Deputy Secretary of Defense, being most... Uh, prominent amongst them, believed that it had to be sooner rather than later. But President Bush uh, did not share that view, thought that, that there could, uh, it could be one of the several issues that gets dealt with as the uh, administration um, unfolds. What moved it from on the list to the top of the list was 9-11, and in particular, the, the way 9-11 changed the president's risk calculus. The, by which I mean the way the president looked at the dangers of things left in the inbox. Uh, because another thing that had been left in the inbox was dealing with this, uh, at that time, not well-known uh, uh, terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, led by, an, at that time, not very well-known leader, bin Laden. Um, and the 9-11 attacks, which were small by the scale of what terrorist experts have been warning the United States to worry about, they were small, but they were they felt so much more painful than you would expect a small attack to feel, dramatically changed the, the president's personal risk calculus. And so 
the whereas before 9/11 some problems seemed to be better to leave that for later after 9/11 has said better to take action now because if you if you leave these problems for later they they become uh, so much larger so if you I agree with you that it was an amalgam of reasons but if you had to boil it down to the common denominator it would be that one a changed risk calculus that's why the administration linked Iraq to 9/11 in their rhetoric. That was that's the the logical thread that was strongest uh, for, across the board in the administration. Yes, it's also true that they wondered initially, could it be that uh, Saddam Hussein had perhaps cooperated with the the terrorists uh, with Bin Laden and the terrorists uh, who had conducted 9/11 attacks? They investigated that. There were some in the administration who thought that was a likely prospect and and gave great weight to the evidence that seemed to point in that direction but uh, within uh, several months uh, most of the people in the administration had left that theory behind but thought that they were still logically linked because of this what the 9-11 attacks revealed about the dangers of the new era and so that's why the president even to the end of his term would speak about 9-11 and Iraq as if they were logically linked because in his mind they were they they reflected the dangers of the new era the dangers that were most vividly on display after 9-11 or by 9-11 the, the danger of Iraq then being not necessarily that it was going to be a conduit for al-Qaeda related terrorism but uh, a, uh, a dictator of long-standing who was unpredictable and had uh, uh, harmed his own people with uh, a, a WMD program, which we believed was more developed at the time uh, than it was, and, and those were the risks that needed to be addressed. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, but, but also the possible nexus to to terrorism. So it, it, this is, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the, uh, the national security team was preoccupied, you might say obsessed, but preoccupied with the concern that that was just the opening salvo in what would be a string of attacks from al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda sympathizers and and uh, copycats and whatnot. That's the first point. And second point, that the next salvo could be w uh, at a higher level of violence uh, using WMD of some sort, chemical uh, radiological uh, or worst case scenario an actual nuclear device um, and they had there was a string of circumstances that seemed to reinforce the po that possibility uh, there was the anthrax attacks if you recall which ended up not being linked to al-qaeda but for a while they didn't know who was doing the anthrax thrax attack um, there was the um, turned out to be a, a false uh, alarm but a possibility of botulinum toxin that had that the White House had been exposed to and then in some of the early cache of material that were captured in Afghanistan when they were um, when they did in fact put al-Qaeda on the run and they captured uh, computer files and other um, materials that made it clear al-Qaeda was looking for WMD was actively trying to secure WMD all of these threads came together to say uh, it's possible that the next attack will be with WMD. So then the question is, how would they get WMD? They could, how would terrorist groups get it? They could try to build it themselves. Very, very hard to do, but we have to protect against that. They could get them from existing large arsenals. That's a little easier for them to do. Uh, where where are the large chemical uh, WMD and where are the large WMD arsenals and, and active WMD programs around the world and which of those programs are in countries that are known to be sympathetic to terrorist groups when you overlay that map you get a couple countries that leap out at the top uh, uh, three at the very top would be Iraq in, in 2002 uh, three at the very top would be Iraq um, uh, Iran and North Korea if you were add two more, you might you might, or a couple more, you might set, have put Libya on that list. Uh, and when you look at that list of countries, there's good reasons for uh, uh, for thinking Iraq was the biggest of those problems, or the one that that was the most time sensitive. And that 
Uh, that chain of analysis is what led them to go from the 9-11 to focusing on Iraq. So if, when the administration would make the case, they would identify three pillars. The first pillar was the, the notion that it was um, uh, you know, going after uh, enforcing the UN resolutions against Iraq's WMD program. Uh, the second pillar was Iraq's long-standing support for terrorism and the danger that that might lead them to be a WMD source for terrorist groups at some point. And then the third pillar was Iraq as a uh, Saddam Hussein as a human rights um, violator, a major uh, uh, tyrant of his own people, and the prospect that if he was replaced with a, a freer Iraqi government, that that might actually uh, be a step forward on addressing sort of the long-term roots of terrorism. Uh, so and so talk about it together, it's the amalgam. That's the case. What, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, when, when you uh, look at the risk factors, uh, if the Bush administration is criticized, it's, it's very much criticized of maybe uh, not considering some of the risk factors uh, connected with uh, intervention. Uh, number one, uh, the notion that, of course, it was going to be a majority Shia government and uh, that was likely to be aligned with Iran, uh, which the next door neighbor shares the uh, uh, also a Shia uh, a state, and many of the Shia politicians were very closely uh, aligned with Iran. So uh, uh, that question uh, about not considering uh, how the removing Saddam, a Sunni power, would affect uh, that. And, uh, and then second, uh, this question of whether intervention by the United States would in some ways ratify bin Laden's narrative that the uh, West was at war with Muslims and at war with Islam and, and uh, therefore uh, be a, uh, uh, become a place which wasn't where this uh, global conflict between the West and Al-Qaeda was taking place, but it, it ultimately became that because of a disfranchised uh, Sunni population uh, there. Um, are those fair criticisms, you think, in terms of the failure to maybe anticipate what the risks of intervention would look like? Uh, I think uh, they are fair criticisms. Uh, I would read the last one a little differently, um, but uh, I I would actually elevate another f uh, failure to be more important. Um, so the 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 intelligence failure that gets the biggest um, amount of attention was the the dis surprise to see how. Uh, small of the arsenals uh, uh, that that Saddam Hussein's uh, WMD arsenal was, and how he wasn't as far advanced in uh, in reconstituting his nuclear program as as the uh, the intelligence estimates had suggested. That's a very prominent intelligence failure. But in some ways, uh, for the way the war unfolded, the larger failure uh, was to the failure to realize how hollow the Iraqi state was and how if you removed Saddam Hussein the rest of the state apparatus would collapse uh, and it, that failure uh, was uh, a failure to realize that w drove many of the decisions that was made in the planning phase but also led to many of the problems that uh, experienced in in phase four the, it's often said that the administration didn't have a phase four plan. I don't think that's right. They had a good plan A for phase four, but they didn't have a good plan B. So if you look at what they, how they thought phase four would go, they did have a plan. It would, they were going to turn over rapidly. Uh, they were going to lop off the top of the Saddam Hussein regime and the deck of cards and you know eliminate just the very 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 top but they expected the rest of the Iraqi state apparatus including the Iraqi security forces uh, to more or less be intact and so they could replace the top regime with uh, a new uh, leadership drawn heavily from the expats uh, who were Iraqis from outside uh, the the country um, and then 
the Iraqi security force would be intact and that would maintain order and the, allow the U.S. to reduce its forces very quickly down to about 30,000 troops uh, by the summer, you know, is what they thought. Hand over the rest of the phase four operations to the United Nations uh, with some U.S. support, but, but the U.S. would be out. That was plan A. What obviously that plan could not be implemented because the Iraqi security force completely disintegrated, uh, and uh, within weeks there was no functioning Iraqi state whatsoever. Uh, and it wasn't just a case of replacing the few people at the top; they, they had to rebuild the state, uh, and they didn't have a good plan B ready. They had to invent plan B on the fly, and it took too long. Um, and by the time they had a plan B and other many, there's other missteps along the way, uh, that had created the conditions for uh, the insurgency to take root, particularly in the Sunni heartland, for the reasons that you identified. Uh, and that, the, that made phase four so much bloodier than the administration had expected. So if plan A had worked, well, then we'd be having a different conversation today. Uh, it didn't work, obviously and plan they had to improvise and it took a long and very uh, costly uh, series of steps to uh, create a viable plan uh, for phase four which I think they did it, we did now this is by the time I got there uh, with the surge you finally had a viable plan but that was a long time coming well let's talk uh, about let's flash forward uh, a fast forward to, to that uh, we get to the 2005-2006 period, and I think it's safe to say we had won the war against Saddam Hussein's Iraq, but we were really losing the secondary uh, phase of the, of the war. There was a very deep sectarian war that uh, had a tremendous amount of violence attached to it, and uh, was, uh, I think it's safe to say, was really spiraling out of control uh, to some degree, certainly much more than we uh, had anticipated or were able to manage at that time. Uh, so explain to the class uh, what was the shift in strategy that really took place. It was announced, I believe, December, January uh, 2006. And uh, what, were the, what were the options before the president uh, and uh, which path did uh, he choose to, uh, did, he, did he choose to take? So your description is is right for 2006. Um, the uh, but in 2005, actually, the, the administration thought that we had turned the corner. So the, the election, the series of steps. So uh, the the administration narrative would be uh, we had a great plan until April uh, 2003. Then from April 2003 to about um, uh, fall 2004 or spring 2005, there was a lot of improvisation and and feeling our way. But finally, by fall 2004 and uh, spring 2005, we fi finally had um, a viable plan for that we thought was showing progress. Uh, and there were a lot of elements to it, personnel, you know, uh, uh, George Casey's military dimension and Zal Khalilzad's political dimension that was pretty well integrated. There was the final progress on the political front in Iraq with the elections. Remember the, the um, purple finger moment when it looked like the Iraqis had finally sort of turned the corner on the political rapprochement piece of it. And so... The administration believed and said publicly multiple times that we thought after a rocky couple years in 2005 we were on our way. And culminating in December 2005 with the Iraqi election, which we thought would be the first, well not fought, we described as accurately the first free and fair election in Iraq under a constitution that had been freely and fairly uh, ratified by a free and fair election and a free process. It was, it, it seemed to be the political momentum that the administration, that Iraq needed to get it over the top. There, yes, there was insurgents activity, there was certainly Al-Qaeda in Iraq activity that was a problem, but we thought that the political progress would outpace and bring along the uh, security progress. And it, what happened in 06 was that the pistons of that 
um, uh, strategy jammed, and they froze up. And over 2006, we s stopped seeing political progress. In fact, it took six months for the newly elected parliament to form a government, which eventually became Maliki. But it was for months and months there was political paralysis, and the security piston froze because the sectarian spiral that you described escalated, escalated, and. Uh, with you know one atrocity after another, in in hindsight, one of the major ones was the blowing up of the Golden Dome, uh, the Samara Mosque. Um, so by the summer of '06, we saw ourselves in a uh, confronting a a self-sustaining sectarian spiral of violence that that uh, looked to us qualitatively different from what say '0304 had been, uh, much much worse than what 0304 had been. And so uh, the, the process from, of 06 was the administration gradually realizing first that the existing strategy wasn't working. And that took some time uh, to, to come to that conclusion. Now, many critics had been saying that on the outside, but they've been saying that for years, and we thought they had been ignoring important bits of the evidence. So uh, it took a while for the administration to realize, you know what, that some of those critics were right. And one of the crucial uh, turning points for the administration in so internal thinking was when we took our published strategy, including all of the assumptions of that strategy, and then assessed, do we still believe those assumptions? Are those assumptions still true? And one by one, we analyze no, that those assumptions were not true. And this is an exercise we did in August, September of 06. And we realize, well, if those assumptions no longer hold, then there's no reason for the strategy to be working. And we concluded, therefore, the strategy that we were pursuing, that the president was publicly defending, uh, probably was not going to work. But then the question is, what do you do? If that's not, what else do you do? And uh, there was a lively internal debate. And we had a couple there were a couple positions. The military position was the strategy is working, stick with it, just tough it out. It's a rocky patch, but tough it out. Uh, that was the military position. State Department position was the strategy is not working, but there is no good strategy. We have to just hunker down on the FOBs, on the forward operating bases, ride out the Civil War, and then restore, uh, you know, work with. Um, uh, Iraqi uh, units sort of in a post-apocalyptic uh, way. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, position that had the most, that seemed the best to the White House uh, staff working on it was what became the surge. Um, and there are other nuanced alternatives as well that were in discussions, but, but those, that's the broad contours. Uh, and the president reached the decision first that the, uh, the strategy wasn't working, and then eventually second that the surge was the, the right alternative. Uh, the sticking point for the surge, there were several sticking points uh, before the president could commit to the, the surge as the idea. One was, did we have the troops? I mean, were, was there even enough troops to do a surge was one. Secondly, if we did a surge, were there things that they could do that were different from what we had been doing for the last couple of years? Why just send more troops to do what wasn't working? But the most crucial one, in hindsight, the most crucial one, we knew it at the time it was very important, but in hindsight it's even more important, was could we work with Maliki? Did we have an Iraqi partner who would do the things we needed them to do? Because one of the big reasons that the existing strategy had not worked was Maliki had not done the things, the Iraqi government had not done the things we needed him to do. And we uh, assessed that we could get Maliki to do the things we needed him to do. Uh, and uh, the president made that decision, and it, that, that portion of the option was called bet on Maliki. You know, are we willing to bet on him? And the surge was in some ways a bet on Maliki. Uh, and uh, the surge worked better, even better in some respects than we thought it might, um, but in part because we were able to get better behavior from Maliki. I mean, so uh, in hindsight, Maliki has been something of a, um, a what proved to be a disappointment in later years, but 
in the crucial years of the surge, uh, General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker were able to work and cooperate with Maliki and uh, in in ways that 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 made the surge strategy work. Well, I, uh, I, there's a lot more to the story, and uh, uh, we'll get to ISIS, but I think this, the, the students will uh, uh, touch on those in, in, the, in their questions. So, Justin, why don't, we, why don't we turn to the students on that? Okay, Sundar, it looks like you've unmuted your mic first here, so you have a question you'd like to ask? I do, and this is for Professor Shanzer and um, anyone else who cares to comment, but in addition to all of the statecraft that we've been discussing this morning regarding the way states could be readily accused of terrorism, we've now seen the media turn their attention and focus on several occasions to lone wolf terrorism. And in terms of the best methodology to approach either preventing or combating that lone wolf terrorism. What is the feeling amongst the participants that the militarization of local law enforcement, of police departments, at local levels, specifically not federal levels, but local levels, would be effective in doing this? And just to clarify, by militarization, I do not just mean an influx of military-style weapons, like assault rifles, with extended magazines and full automatic firing capability, but training perhaps from military components or even special operations military components, which would allow the local law enforcement uh, agencies to develop strategies and tactics and techniques that would combat lone wolf terrorism and prevent lone wolf terrorism. So intelligence would also be included in this. Yeah, let me take that briefly. Um, I, uh, I do want to try to keep us focused on uh, the topic at hand, but we can uh, discuss this because, you know, the things that are going on internationally and the, um, the types of things that we're discussing today uh, definitely uh, built a, a narrative or had a part of a story that is, has been used by uh, terrorist groups to develop this uh, narrative and story to try to inspire uh, others outside of the conflict zones to uh, engage in violence. And I think that's what you're uh, referring to in the lone wolf problem. Um, I make a couple of points. Um, first of all, the lone wolf problem is a, is a problem, but it is not, I, I believe it is, uh, the magnitude of it is not as great as uh, is often portrayed in the media. Uh, while we've had a, a recent spike with uh, respect to ISIS, uh, we've seen some spikes before, uh, but it is not as pervasive. And the lone wolf, while terrorizing in some ways, uh, are really not, they don't have a very high capability. Uh, so even a terrible incident like the Boston Marathon bombing uh, killed four people and injured uh, a, a lot and horrific event. I don't, I don't want to uh, undermine that at all, but um, it, it was no, it's no 9-11 uh, follow-on. And, and other than Boston Marathon and the Fort Hood shooting, all the other things were almost all of them have been preempted uh, prior to any violence. Uh, by law enforcement, uh, by intelligence, and those that weren't preempted have been on a very, very low uh, level. The second point I'll make about the militarization of policing that you mentioned, um, I personally don't think that is very pervasive. Um, I think Ferguson is a whole different kettle of fish uh, and was a very, very poor example of, of policing and how to work with the community. Uh, but if you look at the trend in policing, really, since the 1990s, it's much more a uh, community policing model where uh, communities and police have much, much better relations than they did in Ferguson. Uh, and uh, we're seeing those techniques now being applied to... Um, hold on, I'm going to have to turn off. Sorry, we're seeing those uh, uh, techniques applied uh, 
in many ways to try to strengthen relationships between uh, law enforcement and Muslim American communities uh, with the hope that that can uh, stalve off uh, future uh, incidents of uh, violent extremism. So uh, I do agree with you that uh, I think that's a, a bad direction for law enforcement to head, but I think it's much less pervasive than um, uh, the whole Ferguson incident would lead you to believe. So uh, why don't we get another question, hopefully, on, on Iraq and use of force issues, which is the topic for, uh, for this week. Who's next? Greg, do you have a question there? Uh, yeah. Um, in, um, in talking about why things uh, fell apart towards the end in our, in our failure to... Um, renegotiate so that uh, troops can, can could stay. Um, it, it was mentioned that one of the sticking points was uh, the fact that US troops uh, wouldn't be subject to domestic criminal law, uh, <clears throat> but only to military law. And I was wondering because, I mean, of course, uh, a huge number of those involved are private contractors. Um, who would, of course, be subject to neither domestic law nor military law. Um, and how much of a problem uh, do you think that is? For example, you know, the, the abuses we saw in Abu Ghraib and, and elsewhere, um, there's no accountability for, uh, for military contractors from uh, companies such as Blackwater, etc. So, David, that's more in your lane as a legal question. Do you want to tackle that? Uh, well, why don't you first discuss uh, the whole question of uh, whether for, whether troops were going to stay. This fast forwards uh, to to I guess uh, the first of 2008 period when President Bush first signed the SOFA that called for withdrawal and then the uh, inability to um, renegotiate. Uh, by President Obama in the early parts of his administration, and then I'll touch on the, the legal question because I, I, I want to have a chance to complete the story here a little bit. Right. So the plan all along, uh, in the uh, the plan of this, the long-term aspect of the surge strategy was that over time, once the uh, violence was brought down, once uh, we could get the political piston moving again, eventually we'd hand this problem over back to the Iraqis, and the Iraqis would have the lead, um, and they would be backed up by a sizable uh, U.S. presence, uh, but one that was politically and financially tolerable in the U.S. domain, and the idea was something in the 20,000 range. Uh, how long they would stay, uh, you know, not permanent, but but also, uh, but but somewhat indefinite was the idea. And it was often pointed out that we still had troops in Korea uh, 50, 60 years after the Korean War, and no, and that wasn't producing a lot of toxic uh, political problems for U.S. policymakers. So there probably was the capacity to have um, a sizable U.S. presence on a longer-term basis. Um, to, to bolster the Iraqi forces, especially if it was clear that the Iraqis were in their lead. So that was, uh, that was the plan. And by the way, that was a plan that Maliki uh, supported and the Iraqis recognized they needed and, and in some ways was hardwired into the Iraqi force that we were creating because the Iraqi force wouldn't have an air, a functioning air force for many years to come. Uh, they would rely on, on U.S. for a number of things uh, even under optimistic uh, scenarios for the development of the Iraqi security force. So this was all w widely understood. The problem was, though, for such a long-term or a long-term presence, you needed a status of forces agreement. And every place where U.S. has troops on a long-term basis, they have a status of forces agreement, which is a bilateral treaty negotiated by the two heads of gov or the two governments, and has the force of law, and it adjudicates. What happens if a soldier uh, commits a traffic violation? What happens if they run over a pedestrian? What happens? And it, it spells out all of the what-ifs. Uh, and a crucial element that the U.S. insists on is that if a, a U.S. soldier commits a crime, they'll be punished 
under the UCMJ, the US Uniform Code of Military Justice, not uh, under local law. They would be held accountable, but they'd have to be held accountable uh, within the U.S. Uh, military justice system. Uh, and uh, that was the um, uh, that was a essential ingredient in the uh, Status of Forces Agreement, and it was a difficult one for the Iraqis to offer politically for the reasons that uh, uh, your student, uh, I'm blanking on your name, sir, but your student outlined a number of, of um, horrible things that had happened in the past and that uh, uh, made it politically difficult for the Iraqis to offer that immunity clause. But it was uh, understood that we needed that. The solution, the, the, the Iraqis um, had a number of solutions. One of them was that Maliki said, well, look, I I recognize you need it. I'll I can get it for you, but I can give it to you through executive order, not through the Iraqi parliament. It'd be too hard for me to get through my parliament, but I could give it to you through executive order. And the U.S. lawyer said, "No, no, no. It has to be through the parliament." And parla and uh, Maliki said, "Well, I can't get it to you until after the elections, because there was another parliamentary elections going on. He didn't want." Uh, they were a democracy to this extent. They didn't want to make a tough decision before an election. They wanted to do it after. So it was understood, okay, you will do, we will do this after the election. But we will do this after the election. And that was the plan. In the interval, uh, several things happened. First, the Bush administration replaced by the Obama administration. Different team, different approach, a different, crucially, a different way of handling Maliki. And I think that's where the Obama administration made some very unfortunate mistakes. They downgraded their relationship with Maliki, and he became much more difficult to work with in the uh, Obama era than he had been in the Bush era, because, in part, I think, because of the downgrading that he felt in the relationship. But uh, the other problem was that the Iraqi election produced a, uh, a hung result and didn't produce the decisive result that Maliki had been counting on, and so... Uh, there was par political paralysis again, which meant that they were unable to deliver on the immunity clause, uh, which meant that the um, administration uh, was faced with a choice. Do we leave the troops behind without the immunity clause passed by parliament? Uh, and it was the unanimous view of the U.S. government lawyers that, no, you couldn't do that for the risk that would uh, expose. Uh, and so... Uh, rather, the, that, the crucial aspect of the plan, leaving behind sizable U.S. troops to help bolster the Iraqis and also to provide adequate intelligence uh, and for the U.S. and a number of other positive things that the forces would provide, all of that was gone. And we went, instead of having 20K, which was the Bush plan, or, or 10K or less, which had been the Obama plan, we had zero essentially, except for the troops that were guarding the embassy. And it meant that we were blind, uh, or more blind than we otherwise would have been, to some of the developments that, that happened after we left. And the, the situation in Iraq unraveled rapidly after U.S. troops went, uh, le departed at the end of 2011. And so the, the failure to secure that long-term uh, understanding to get the the troops back was uh, was crucial and, and an important part of the story. The the only debate is can that be blamed on the Obama administration or was that baked into the cake of the conflict of of interest and the political situation in Iraq? Um, uh, and I suppose you can have a debate about whether the twenty thousand troops would have made a difference anyway. Uh, but uh, there's no debate that it's unfortunate what has happened since. Just to clarify. It the Bush couldn't uh, get over the SOFA problem uh, before he left office, too, and the agreement he reached with, um, with uh, Maliki at that point did call for a full withdrawal, and then the discussion uh, that you talk about was the failure to essentially renegotiate that initial uh, right. agreement, correct? Right, so, the, uh, right. so the, when, the, when the, the Maliki came back and said, we could, I could give you this by executive order, and and the, the lawyer said, no, 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 we need something uh, stronger than that. Okay, I can't get that to you afterwards, so let's negotiate an interim deal, 
right, right, right. interim deal will have this, it goes to zero, but we all agree that's not what we're going, what we want. That's just what the interim deal says, and we're going to renegotiate that and get, get a, a negotiate something that will allow a large number of troops to, um, to have hold. But as you point out, uh, once it became, once the Obama administration failed to secure that agreement, they went back and said, oh, we're blaming Bush. We're just doing what Bush said. Bush had a deal, signed a deal that said to zero, uh, which is technically true but very misleading because, of course, it was widely understood that they were going to renegotiate that and get a replace it with something that would allow a sizable U.S. presence. That's what Bush intended. That's also what Obama intended and tried to implement. In fact, Pr Vice President Biden famously said, I'll bet you my vice presidency that we'll, we'll – we'll get this deal. He, he was so confident that we would get it. Um, and then when they failed, they sort of uh, retreated to uh, say, oh, it's just uh, the Bush deal. That That's all. We're just implementing the Bush deal. So let me briefly uh, discuss this question of uh, liability for contractors. Um, this was a pretty hot topic uh, a, a while back. Uh, there's some irony to the question coming up uh, this week because there was just a, a, a conviction inside the United States uh, of some of the Blackwater uh, individuals for the atrocities that are, uh, occurred. Uh, so there has been some uh, very lo long delay, but some sort of sense of justice uh, uh, occurring out of that incident. Um, I'm not uh, totally familiar with all of the niceties, but I think what you've pointed out with your question is uh, there was certainly a gap in U.S. law as to how contractors that were really um, facilitating the uh, ability of, uh, of both the troops and the U.S. civilian side to operate inside of Iraq. Um, so the Blackwater incident uh, that is so famous and that was just uh, prosecuted in U.S. courts was actually wasn't contractors who were doing military activities, they were the security forces for State Department uh, officials uh, and um, were helping them try to move through uh, a various territory. So um, there were multiple efforts in Congress uh, to try to fix this problem and again to get contractors more clearly under a legal regime, which would again call for um, action to take place under U.S. law, but the changes were made in the law to um, make it easier to uh, bring uh, cases with respect to prosecutors who, who engaged in criminal uh, activity uh, or alleged criminal activity uh, in a war zone. Um, so uh, I don't believe it's ever been the intention of the U.S. government to have this gap in the law so that there'd be some immunity, uh, blanket immunity, uh, for either its military or uh, its paid contractors operating uh, outside the United States. But I think you're correct to point out that the law wasn't clear enough and there was a gap that I believe has now been uh, corrected uh, going forward. Uh, let's have a, a question from our third student, uh, Justin. Uh, Paul. Paul, do you have a question? Yes, um, this is uh, probably not when you were in the White House, but when Paul Bremer um, was appointed, he demilitarized the um, Iraqi army, and um, and both party members were were sacked from their positions. Uh, what was the reason for doing this? Mm -hmm. So those uh, two separate. Uh, I, have I lost you? No, I'm. You're good. You're still here. Okay. All right. I did there. I'm mic. still here. I'm just turning off the mic. Okay. Um, the uh, so there's the debathification. The uh, the plan all along had been to debathify the top level, by which they meant that the topmost leaders of Iraq, who all of them had to be senior Ba'ath Party members because it was a Ba'athist dictatorship. Um, they they would be stripped of their office, and the uh, the debate was how far down did you go, and the U.S. view was that at some point uh, it it was 
unfair to uh, hold Ba'ath Party membership against lower-ranking uh, uh, officials who uh, were not complicit in the leadership of Baghdad, a Ba'ath Party, not complicit in the decision-making. They were basically low-level low functionaries um, and uh, would be needed to run the new Iraq because they might be uh, technocrats, you know, they were the ones who they would operate the public utilities or something and they had to be Ba'ath Party members in order to have that job but they were otherwise, uh, it was token membership, was the US assessment. The Iraqi partners that we were dealing with uh, viewed, uh, viewed them with much more suspicion and much and viewed the and, and so we're pushing for and driving for a level of debathification that went several layers below what the U.S. wanted to do. And this was an, a, a matter of, of tension between the U.S. Uh, leaders and the Iraqi partners that we were trying to deal with and trying to uh, have them take over running the government. But one of the things that they were most keen on doing was debathifying, quote-unquote, to a, a very deep level. Uh, and in the end, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, struck a compromise that allowed them to debathify deeper than the U.S. thought was wise, but the, the compromise, if we didn't allow them, we would lose the Iraqi partners. Um, and so I, I think historians can be debating that for forever. If Bremer had insisted on sticking it just with the very topmost, what would have happened to our Iraqi partners? That's a, uh, would we have lost them? Uh, that was the that was the choice he was face, facing. the The choice on the um, military was a was a little bit different. It's true that Bremer gave the order to dissolve the Iraqi military, but that order was given after the Iraqi military had more or less dissolved itself. I mean, it, the the Iraq the U.S. expected to that the 2003 war would go the way the, 2000, the 1991 war had gone. And in 1991, large units of the Iraqi military surrendered intact. And I don't know if you remember, but the images of that war in 1991 were uh, um, uh, prisoner of war camps with tens of thousands of Iraqi intact units basically uh, there. Uh, and thus, easily reconstituted uh, if you replace the top leadership. And that had been the plan uh, in 2003. We thought we'd see, uh, the U.S. thought they'd see a similar phenomenon and that they would have might even very senior Iraqi generals surrendering with their command structure intact. Uh, and so it would be just that, you know, replay of 1991, hand them over. But the, Ara but the U.S., uh, um, military plan was uh, the, the phrase catastrophically successful in the sense that it it was so fast in um, in the shock and awe phase of outpacing the Iraqi military that the Iraqi military didn't even have time to surrender intact they large units just dissolved just um, collapsed. It's also the case we now know that in the intervening dozen years, the military had been hollowed out a little bit as part of the coup prevention strategy that, that Saddam Hussein had been doing uh, meant that the units were not as strong as they had been maybe, uh, you know, the, 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 the units didn't have the internal um, cohesion that they might have had uh, a dozen years earlier. In any case, uh, large, large units melted away. And, and so they didn't have the problem of intact units as prisoners of war, they had the problem of where was the Iraqi army? It was gone. Large units of it's gone. At this point, my, I think the mistake, so given that, that was the reality they faced, um, and by the way, the person responsible for making these ca calculations and decisions on the ground working for Bremer was Walt Slocum, who was the Undersecretary of Policy in the Clinton administration. Uh, and so was kind of the defensive advisor. He was going to be the advisor to the, the new Iraqi uh, Department of Defense. And while Slocum's calculation was 
the Iraqi army has dissolved. We didn't expect that to happen, but it has happened. It will be easier to build it up from scratch than to try to reconstitute it. Uh, and so they committed themselves to rebuilding the Iraqi uh, military from scratch, and that's what that order to quote unquote dissolve the Iraqi army was. It was an order to we're building it up from scratch. My read is that the mistake they made was in not saying, however, you know, giving that order, but then at the same time saying, however, we're going to continue to pay the old Iraqi army until we rebuild it from scratch. Um, and for, I, I think this was a mistake, and I think they now in hindsight see it as a mistake because within weeks they countermanded that and they said, oh yeah, yeah, we'll continue to pay. But that was a, in that interval, it was a crucial interval when uh, you had a lot of people with guns because they took their guns back home who had just been told, uh, you don't have a job, you don't have a future in the new Iraq. Uh, and uh, they, uh, that's, that was a seedbed for the Iraq, for the insurgency. In hindsight, I think if they had instead said, we'll continue to pay you, uh, as we're building the new Iraqi army, uh, the implementation of that would have been very difficult, very challenging, to be sure, and probably uh, lots of waste, fraud, and abuse opportunities uh, in, in such a plan. But in hindsight, that would have been cheap compared to what we ended up having to pay. Uh, and so I think that was that, that that's one of the um, tactical mistakes, I think, that was done at the time. But just to clarify, I don't think the tactical mistake was dissolving the Iraqi army, because that was that happened without our saying it. The tactical mistake was not paying for the old the old army while they built the new army. Does that answer your question? Well, uh, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our hour and it's gone by very quickly and uh, as always, there are issues left on the table, but I think Peter, you've uh, you know, you've given us a, a great sense of the history and and insight into the decision making inside the administration. Those, you know, the issues you, you've raised, they're debated and uh, disagreed with uh, by many, and and that's the nature of the debate. And we're going to continue to have the historical debate. Uh, unfortunately, of course, because uh, the Iraq situation uh, is in an, yet another chapter uh, uh, now, which uh, we're all tragically trying to deal with. Uh, uh, if we had more time, we'd uh, go into that, but I think uh, all the students who are going to watch this around the globe are uh, definitely to uh, th uh, uh, at, uh, to at your uh, benefit uh, for uh, for spending this uh, hour with us, and we're very very grateful. My, uh, happy to do it. Peter Fever, thank you. Students, thank you for participating, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next uh, Hangout.